Hello again, Steve Fentress for the Strassenburg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and this week, Jupiter, a miniature solar system. And the reason for doing that now is that if you are up late, can't sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, maybe you're noticing a really bright light rising in the southeast after one o'clock in the morning. It's the planet Jupiter, with Saturn almost in the same direction in space, so appearing close to it in the sky. And it's down there in the southeast if you have a clear view with a lot of stars. By the way, our clock on the Stellarium program includes Julian day numbers. This is a system astronomers use to calculate how many days it is between two dates without getting confused by leap years and time zones and things like that. Uh, but we don't need to worry about it. So this is our early morning sky. Saturn following Jupiter and over there Mars coming up even later. And on the morning of May 8th, the moon just past full will be lighting up the night. And as morning comes, the moon and Jupiter will be the last things to disappear as the sky brightens. Looking at Jupiter through a telescope, even at moderately low power, you see little stars arranged on either side, and Galileo noticed those back in 1609 and realized that they were moons going around Jupiter, and that opened up the modern era of astronomy, realizing that those planets in the sky were not just lights being pushed around by the gods, but were other worlds. And the moons of Jupiter, when they're spread out, make a pretty large angle in the sky. Theoretically, if you have really good eyesight, you might be able to see them without binoculars or a telescope. Most people can't though, but binoculars will show them nicely. And every evening that you look, you'll see the moons in a different arrangement. There are online websites like this one from Sky and Telescope, where you can put in a date and a time and it will draw a little diagram of where to expect to see the moons of Jupiter and what they'll be doing over the next few hours. The moons are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto in that order from Jupiter outward. Let's see how Jupiter fits into our solar system using the NASA's EYES program. And so here's the sun at the center. Let's move a little closer. The orbit of Jupiter is about five times farther out than the orbit of Earth. So sunlight is about five times five or 25 times weaker at Jupiter than it is for us. And let's click to zoom and look at the Jupiter system. There it is, as seen from above Jupiter's North Pole, roughly. The big moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. And we're going to turn on the orbit of the spacecraft that is in orbit around Jupiter right now, the Juno spacecraft, because we'll be looking at that orbit. We put time into motion. Notice how the innermost moons go faster, the outermost moons go slower. The same laws of planetary motion that govern our solar system as a whole govern this miniature solar system of large moons going around Jupiter. Now there's an interesting relationship in the timing of these moons. Let's stop when Io and Europa are fairly close to each other. See, right about there, roughly at the three o'clock place. And then let's put time into fast forward again. There's Io, there's Europa. And let's go forward until Europa has completed one orbit and comes back to the same place. I'll try to stop it on time. And Io has also come back to the same place after completing two orbits. So in the time Europa took to make one revolution, Io made two. There's Ganymede down there at about the five o'clock position. Let's watch a whole revolution of Ganymede. And remember where Europa and Io were.
and we stop Ganymede and Io and Europa are back to the same places. So there is this relationship between the orbits of the inner moons of Jupiter. In the time that uh, Ganymede uh, uh, takes to make one orbit, Europa makes two and Io makes four. There's this almost exact resonance, astronomers call it. Io, four orbits, Europa, two orbits, Ganymede, one orbit in the same time. So the arrangements of those three inner moons repeat over and over again. There's the orbit of the Juno spacecraft, which is on a very long uh, elliptical orbit that takes 53 days to make one trip around. Let's go back to the time that Juno arrived at Jupiter, which was in the summer of 2016, to see how its orbit has changed. And we're going to speed time up until Juno arrives in July 2016. There it is. And the original plan for this spacecraft was to do a few orbits with this very long ellipse of 53 days. And notice how the orbit is in line with the dividing line between day and night on Jupiter. Juno is a solar-powered spacecraft, so each time it makes an orbit, it needs to not go through the shadow of Jupiter. Now, the original plan was that after a couple of these long orbits, uh, Juno's rocket engine would be fired to put it into a shorter orbit where it would make a loop every 14 days and make many orbits of Jupiter that way. But there was a malfunction in the propulsion system after one of the early firings, and the engineers decided it would not be a good idea to fire that engine again. So for the rest of its mission, Juno was going to be in this 53-day orbit that was at one time lined up with the day-night dividing line on Jupiter. But as time has gone on, Jupiter takes about 12 Earth years to revolve once around the Sun. So since Juno arrived at Jupiter, the planet has completed about a quarter of a trip around the Sun, as we'll see. We go forward in time really fast here. And the orbit of the Juno spacecraft is remaining in the same orientation with respect to the distant stars. So that means over the four years since it arrived, the relationship of the Juno spacecraft's orbit to Jupiter has changed. So now it is going out onto the side of Jupiter that's beyond the Sun, and they've got to be careful to adjust that orbit if possible to make sure that Juno does not go into the dark because it's a solar-powered spacecraft. The idea of Jupiter was, uh, the idea of the Juno spacecraft was to make as many close orbits around Jupiter as possible to allow Jupiter's magnetic field to deflect the spacecraft in subtle ways that would indicate what's inside Jupiter. Jupiter has a lot of features. The planet itself is about 11 times wider than Earth. And we're using the NASA's eyes software to visualize some of these features. First of all, we've been looking at Jupiter's four largest moons, but it has many others. You can look up the latest count, over 60. And most of those higher numbered moons are way out and mostly in irregular orbits. That is, they are not in the same plane as the orbits of the big moons and they may not even go in the same direction. So Jupiter is the boss of a vast region of the outer solar system with its powerful gravity. Let's turn off those minor moons. There are so many of them. Slow down the motion. Get closer again. Find some other features. Jupiter has northern and southern lights. Those have been detected with, uh, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope. Those are places where electrically charged particles crash into Jupiter's upper atmosphere, steered by its extremely powerful magnetic field.
Those auroras are best seen with ultraviolet light. Here's a visualization of the lines of force in Jupiter's magnetic field. And that magnetic field steers electrically charged atomic particles into orbits around Jupiter, making radiation belts, which we'll see in a moment. And the reason for putting Jupiter, uh, the Juno spacecraft, in this long elliptical orbit is so that it spends a minimum amount of time on each orbit actually inside the most intense part of Jupiter's radiation belts and magnetic field because those things are bad for electronics on spacecraft. They would be lethal to a human being. We take away the orbits of the moons so we can see the magnetic field lines. And Jupiter, on top of everything else, has a ring, really faint, not visible with a telescope from the Earth, discovered by the Voyager spacecraft looking back toward the sun, as we'll see in a moment. There goes a shadow of a moon on the planet. What's inside Jupiter? The latest from the Juno spacecraft is indicating that there is a layer of clouds on top that we see, and then another layer of circulation just below that. And then below that, Jupiter is mostly a liquid object, liquid metallic hydrogen, which is an electrically conducting liquid that exists only at extremely high pressures, like those created by Jupiter's gravity. And then maybe some rock and ice at the core of Jupiter. And as the information from the Juno mission is analyzed, we'll get a better and better idea of what's actually inside this giant planet. There's the famous Great Red Spot, a storm about two or three times the size of Earth. And the rest of the atmosphere marked by these distinct dark and light bands what really exploded our understanding of Jupiter was the Voyager 1 spacecraft visit back in March of 1979. The Voyager 1 antenna dish there is about 12 feet in diameter, to give you an idea of the size. And unless the spacecraft was doing something else, that antenna was kept pointed at Earth for communications. That is phone home. Very important to keep the antenna pointed at Earth. And the Voyager encounter in 1979 was carefully planned. Watch this. The timing was arranged to try to get a look not only at Jupiter, but as good a look as possible at as many moons as possible. So a nice approach to Io, a nice approach to Ganymede, and a nice approach to Callisto, and exit the Jupiter system at the proper angle going in the right direction to reach Saturn about 20 months later. Now that is planning. A few months later, the Voyager 2 spacecraft arrived at Jupiter, went by Callisto. You may remember Voyager 1 did not get a good look at Europa, but Voyager 2 made up for that by getting pretty close. And then had its path bent by Jupiter's gravity so that it departed the Jupiter system going in the right direction at the right speed to reach Saturn a couple of years later. So I can remember sitting in an auditorium at Caltech back in 1979 when these pictures were shown to the world for the first time. No one had ever seen Jupiter in this detail, in this much detail, the great red spot. I can remember the gasps in the audience when these appeared on the screen. Weird looking clouds. And of course, the moons of Jupiter, which previously had been just blobs of light or dots, even in giant telescopes. We'll get to those in a moment. As Voyager approached Jupiter over several months, taking pictures regularly enabled it to make this movie of the circulation. Notice the rotation of the great red spot, like a ball bearing between two bands of clouds going in opposite directions.
big revolutionary discovery. This is Jupiter's inner moon, Io, and you see that little puff on the horizon there. It was discovered in this picture, a young engineer named Linda Morobito doing her job late at night analyzing incoming pictures of the moons noticed this little feature on the horizon. It turned out to be an erupting volcano on a moon of Jupiter. Here's a later movie taken by the Galileo spacecraft showing the eruption in progress. There are erupting volcanoes all over Jupiter's moon Io, erupting a mixture of melted sulfur and melted rock, producing this weird orange color. Next moon out, Europa, white, covered with these lines that turn out to be fractures in an ice crust. These appear to be icebergs floating on an ocean of liquid water, and there are other clues indicating liquid water in the giant moons of Jupiter. So out there where it's so cold, how do you get warm enough to make volcanoes or liquid water? The answer is tidal flexing. Remember, these moons have these relationships that repeat over and over again, the close approaches. When you flex any solid material repeatedly, you heat it up. These moons are getting flexed repeatedly by approaching each other, and that produces enough heat to create liquid water and heat for volcanic activity on the inside. Here's Jupiter's biggest moon, Ganymede, a mosaic of Voyager pictures taken in different colors. And the outer of the the outermost of the giant moons, Callisto, completely covered with craters. Another big Voyager discovery: the ring around Jupiter. Red, green, and blue pictures put together and aligned in a way to show the color of the ring. Jupiter gives off more heat than it receives from the sun. This is from the European Southern Observatory. On your right, a picture taken by an amateur astronomer. On your left, a picture taken by a telescope with an infrared camera at the same time. And you can see heat coming from inside the planet. Here's a NASA video as NASA's Juno spacecraft approached Jupiter on August 27, 2016. The Gyram instrument captured the planet's glow in infrared light. So the heat from Jupiter is leftover heat from when Jupiter formed. When you compress material, you heat it up. Jupiter is not big enough to have nuclear reactions going on in its core. That would make it a star, but it's not quite big enough for that. So this is leftover heat from the formation of the planet billions of years ago. Jupiter was hit by a comet in 1994. It's been hit by comets many times. But the 1994 impact, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, made these blotches in the clouds that were visible all through that summer, even in small telescopes. Here's the NASA's eyes program again to show in a little more detail what the current mission, Juno, is doing and its orbit. Here's the approach to Jupiter. The idea was to get into an orbit that makes very close, very fast passes near the planet and then quickly departs from that dangerous radiation belt zone to spend most of its time far, far from the planet where it's safe. So here's the retro rocket firing to allow the spacecraft to be captured into orbit around Jupiter. That was the beginning of the 53-day orbit that Juno is still in. Look at those solar panels. Those are many feet long, the biggest solar panels that have ever been flown on an interplanetary spacecraft. Juno was not originally designed to be a photography mission, but they did put a camera on it, thinking it would be fun for public outreach. But it turned out the Juno cam has revealed the complexity of Jupiter's weather as never before. Really complicated swirls of clouds, especially in the north and south polar regions, which no previous spacecraft got a good look at. Here we are looking right at one of the poles of Jupiter, and we can see number six there, just about at the south pole, and then six other vortices surrounding it. And here's 
Jupiter's polar region seen with an infrared camera on the Juno spacecraft. Once again, we're seeing heat coming from inside the planet. Well, here are some of the weird things that amateur astronomers like to watch for. The rare times when there are the shadows of three moons on the disk of the planet. And this can happen only uh, in periods that occur every few years where Callisto is in the right place to cast one of those shadows. It happened back in 2015. Uh, the next time we'll get a really good look at a triple shadow on Jupiter from Rochester will be in 2032. Kind of geeky, but amateur astronomers are interested in that. Here's another kind of weird thing amateurs like to watch for. Occasions when no moons are visible at low power around Jupiter. They're either in front of the planet or behind it. It's happening on May 28th, 2020, but it'll be after sunrise as seen from Rochester, so we won't see it from here but we will get another occasion of Jupiter with quote-unquote no moons on July 27th and 28th, 2033, right through the middle of the night. So, if you don't want to look at 1 o'clock in the morning, wait a month, it'll be up at a, about 11.30 at night. Jupiter, a miniature solar system, rising into the sky to light up the rest of the night.